Thanks for joining us here today. If this is your first time or you're returning to us, let me encourage you to go to JesusIsTheRock.org. While you're there, give us an update on how God is working in your life. Now, if He's working life change through our ministries, let me encourage you to give to us financially on the website by clicking the giving button at the top right hand corner of the screen. Thank you so very much for tuning in today, and welcome to Church Well, I struggled with just how to preach this message. I really kind of pondered it over and over in my mind, how to put it together and how to present it without sounding offensive or condemning. And quite frankly, I'm not sure I can. I'm not sure I can preach this without it sounding uh, convicting and condemning, at least to some of us. At least to some of us. I'm going to begin by using a passage that I've taught from many, many times before, and I've even taught from it uh, pretty recently a couple of times but so I'm not going to read it all this morning I just want to read a little portion of it out of uh, Romans chapter 7 uh, this is the Apostle Paul writing uh, here and, and look at verse 18 he says and I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature I want to do what's right but I can't. I want to do what's good. But I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong. But I do it anyway. Is there anybody can relate so far? But if, if I do what I don't want to do, I'm not really the one doing it. it it's the sin living in me that does it. He said, I've discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what's wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there's another power within me that's at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still, everybody say still, still. that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? <coughs> and that's Paul. If I were going to try and give this message a title this morning, I think I would title it, What Do I Do When I've Sinned Like That? What do I do when I've sinned like that? When I say like that, some of you immediately know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah. Right? I, I know. I'm, I'm there. I got you, Pastor. What, I'm, I'm really, you got my attention. What do I do when I've sinned like that? Because you know what? I've sinned like that. I know what you're talking about. You don't even have to explain it. Please don't. Some of you are thinking. Don't put my picture on the screen. What do I do when I've sinned like that? Some of you are on the fence. Well, hmm, not sure. Think I've probably sinned like that. You know, I don't know, I've never killed anybody, if that's what you're talking about, but and then there are a few of you, this may almost be irrelevant to you. This message, you may almost get a pass on this message this morning. There, there are a few of you you may you say, you know, I just don't think I've sinned like that. What do I mean when I say like that? Well, I, I refer you back to verse 24. What a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? There is a desperation here that, that's, not, that's not normal. Keep in mind, this is the Apostle Paul writing that, if that makes you feel any better. This is, this is Paul. What could have possibly caused Paul to pin down such words as these? We can only speculate. That's not me, is it? Okay. Somebody. All right. Uh, let me turn 
by myself. I usually do anyway. <laughs> Better not be anybody be calling me this time of day. Uh, what could have caused Paul to write this? We don't know. How could, how could Paul have sinned like that? And keep in mind, he's not talking about when he was Saul and he was killing Christians. You know, that could get you pretty guilt-ridden. You kill people just because they were Christ followers. Well, Paul, before he got converted, that's what he did. He was very, um, you know, religious and, and he... He was part of a group of people who were murdering people just for being Christ followers. So I can understand how that guilt could follow you. But, but that's not what he's talking about. Whatever Paul's struggling with, it's today. And it's bad. And it's ever before him. Maybe Paul had an affair with a married woman. Maybe Paul had an affair with a married man. I don't know. Don't leave here and say Pastor said Paul was homosexual. I mean, that's not what. Maybe Paul pulled an all night drunk and woke up horribly hungover and wrote these words. I don't know. We're not told. We don't know what it was. What we do know, it wasn't a one time thing. There's an ongoing struggle here, inevitably. Whenever I want to do what's right, I don't. Whenever I want, don't want to do what's wrong, I do the wrong thing. This power makes me a slave to the sin. Who will free me? This is not a one-time thing. He calls, it a, he calls it a thorn in his flesh. And he says it's a messenger sent by Satan. Whatever that is, that demon he's fighting, whatever that sin is that, that's, that's, that's so wrong in his life, and he's prayed about it. He's asked God to help him. And God has said no. But he said, my grace is sufficient. But I'm not going to take it away. Because he said, if I took it away, Paul, you'd start thinking you were something. So he said, to keep me humble, God allows this thing to be ever present. But who's going to free me? How can I overcome this thing? I don't know what it was that Paul was, but something made this man of God scratch down this guilt-ridden confession. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who's going to free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? What do I do when I've sinned like that? How do I go to God and ask God for forgiveness for a sin like that? Forgive me when I've been unfaithful to my spouse. How do, I, how do I ask God to forgive me when I've abused or molested a child? I mean a sin like that. What, what do I even say to God when I purposely broke His commandments and broke His heart? What do I do when I've sinned like that? Well, Paul certainly was not alone when it came to sinning like that. If you remember one of the most notorious sinners, remember King David? You know, the man after God's own heart. The man after God's own heart. You know, David, the one that danced before the Lord with all of his might. Remember David that took a little slingshot and killed a giant? So he's defying the armies of the living God. The God that delivered me out of the hand of the lion and the bear will deliver me out of this hand of this Philistine. Let's see what David said when David sinned like that. In Psalm 51, verse 3, David says, I recognize my rebellion. It haunts me night and day. Some of you, you may not only outside, but the inside, you say, yeah, it haunts me night and day. Against you and you alone have I sinned, and I've done what's evil in your, evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you say, and your judgment against me is just. 
I was born a sinner. From the moment my mother conceived me, whatever you do to me, I deserve. Whatever I get. We know a little more about David's sin than we do Paul's. At least this one. That's not to imply this was his only one by any means. But, but in fact, in verse 5, he admits he was born a sinner. From the moment my mother conceived me. Now we know about the, the story of Bathsheba. Bathsheba, uh, one of David's mighty men. One of his, one of his confidant. One, one, of his, one of his best soldiers was Uriah the Hittite. As far as we know, Uriah went back with David all the way to the cave of Adullam. Way back then, he's been right there faithfully. If you got to David, you had to come through Uriah first. Well, his wife was Bathsheba. David's very, very, very best friend in the whole world, other than maybe Jonathan when they were small, but as an adult and as a king, his vice president, his second in command, his guy right there was a man named Ahithophel. It was Ahithophel's granddaughter. This is not some random person. This is his best bodyguard and his best friend ever. This is their Bathsheba that he sees taking a bath, calls for her, brings her over, sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, gets scared, brings her husband home from the battlefield, says, go in and Spend a few days with your wife. Take a break from the war. Go in because now he's going to try to set him up because she's pregnant so I can get her husband home. But one thing he doesn't count on is Uriah is a man of character. Uriah says, thank you, David, but I can't do that. Not while our men are out fighting on the battlefield. Huh? Let me see. Plan B. Sin always takes you further than you want to go cost you more than you want to pay. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. Now you're trying to wiggle out of your sin. So he brings Uriah back over and he starts giving him drink, giving him drink. Get him, gets him drunk. Says, now go on home. Love on your wife. The Bible tells us Uriah the Hittite went home and laid at the door of his house all night because he said, I can't go in. Drunk or not drunk. This may sound great. I just thought about this real character maybe when you do the right thing even when you're drunk. <laughs> Am I right? One guy went out drinking one night. he come in late. He knew he was fixing to get chewed out and all, but he came in and he, he, he slipped in and he laid down. And The next morning his wife come in, brought him breakfast in bed, kissed him on his forehead. Huh? Yeah, and he was a little nervous. He's like, oh. Because he knew he was had it coming that day. And his wife walked out and his, his son, he called and said, come, come, come here, come here. What, uh, you, what happened? Why is she being so nice to me? The son laughed and you don't remember? And he said, no. He said, when you came in last night, mom come over and kissed you on the cheek and you said, hey, leave me alone. I'm married. <laughs> <laughs> Character's doing the right thing even when you're drunk. Uriah did the right thing, even drunk. And so David, now desperate. Sin pushes you to desperation. He sends Uriah back to the front lines with a note in his pocket. Uriah's got so much character, he doesn't even read the note. The note says, put Uriah on the front line. It's to his commander-in-chief, Joab. He says, put Uriah on the front line and withdraw all hell. Joab says, okay. Puts him up there. Of course, it's just a, that long. Uriah's dead. Joab comes back and says, mission accomplished. David goes through a little phony morning. We, who, who, well, you win some, you lose some. Sin. His confidant, his, 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 his bodyguard, his, his, his right hand guy. That's what David's crying in his beer about.
I guess what I'm trying to find out this morning, has anyone ever sinned like that? Anyone ever felt like that? And I know, I know we say all the time, sin is sin. And sins, one sin's as bad as another sin. And I think for the most part I say amen to that. I, I agree with that. There's a, there's a lot of scripture that tells us that if you're guilty of one sin, you're guilty of all. Although I, I will throw one little curve in it. Just not, not just I don't want to muddy the waters too much. But the Bible does talk about eight things that God hates. So, I, I, you know, th there may be a little something there. But I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about... I'm ta God, sin may be the same to God, but it's not the same to us, is it? No, 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 no. There's a difference. As hard as we may try to make it not be, there is a difference. There is sin that we can sin and say, you know, well... I God, I'm sorry and I did it and I, you know, I shouldn't have done it and go on and never give it another thought. And then there's sin that haunts us. The guilt and the shame and the pain. I mean, we're not talking about overeating here. I'm not talking about gluttony. I, I mean when you've sinned like that. I think it's Psalm 104 where David says, the Lord remembers that we're just dirt. And sometimes we, we use that to make us feel a little better about ourselves and our sin. You know, we're just dirt. We're wretched. That's the way we are. We got this nature. And But have you ever felt like your dirt was just a little dirtier than other people's dirt? Your sin was a little worse than the average sin? I mean, other people's probably dealing with an ugly thought, you know. But, but me, I'm, I'm dealing with pure evil. Other people, de I'm dealing with pure lust. I'm not just a little lust, a lot of lust. I'm dealing with real bitterness here. Not just a little, but a lot. <coughs> I'm not just having an affair. I'm cheating on the person I'm having the affair with. What do you do when you sin like that? I'm not just abusing pills. I'm out of control. I'm losing my mind here. What do you do when you sin like that? Well, David gives us a couple of hints. And we're going to look at these real quickly. And then we're going to go back. And we're going to look at, at, at how Paul handled something in, in his darker moments. And hopefully, the whole point of this, this is going to help you if, if you've ever or if you should ever sin like that. Back in Psalm 51, verse number 6. Let's, let's back up to verse 5. David said, I was born a sinner from the moment my mother conceived me. Listen to verse 6. But you desire honesty from the womb. You desire, everybody say, get honest. When you sin like that, the first thing you need to do is get honest. And if you can't get honest with anybody else, you need to get honest with God and get honest with yourself. Verse 4, he said, Against you and you alone have I sinned. I've done what's evil in your sight. You're going to be proven right in what you say. And your judgment against me is just. I deserve whatever I get. Because I sin like that. Stop calling it an accident. Stop calling it an incident. Stop calling it a mistake. And call it what it is. Willful, dirty, disgusting, perverted, twisted sin. Call it what it is. David said you desire honesty. You desire repentance, a broken spirit. I believe God's sick and tired of listening to our excuses for sin and our justification for iniquity. If it's sin, call it sin. If it's lust, call it lust. If it's bitterness, call it. If it's unforgiveness, call it unforgiveness. I don't forgive them. I can't forgive them. I won't forgive them. Call it what it is. Call it what it is. If it's prejudice, say it's prejudice. Say, I don't like white people. Say, I don't like black people. I don't like Hispanic people. I don't like Catholics. I don't like Baptists. I don't like Pentecost. I don't like it, whatever it is. Call it what it is. If it's pride, say it's pride. I'm eating up with pride. I think I am better than them. Yeah, I do. 
If it's addiction, call it addiction. Call it what it is. Get honest. Get honest. Now look at verse 6. He says, But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Even where? In our sin. Teaching everybody say wisdom. Get honest. Secondly, get wisdom. Get wisdom. Learn from our sin. Listen to me, church. We can gain wisdom even in our sin. Can't we? In fact, sometimes, sometimes, Danny, God can show us something in our sin He can't show us in our success. Sometimes God can teach us in our failure a lot more than He can teach us in our victory. We can gain wisdom even in our sin, even in our failure. Let me give you a little, my definition of, of wisdom. Wisdom is having the ability to look at the same situation everybody else is looking at, only in a broader spectrum. Everybody else is looking at the problem and saying, oh, I don't know. This is horrible. This is bad. This is what we're going to do. Wisdom steps in and says, hey, but wait a minute. Let's back up. Let's look at all of this. And they say, oh, yeah. That's wisdom. Wisdom's being able to look at a situation only in a broader spectrum. Wisdom. When, when you look at your sin and all you see is your sin, that's not Wisdom. But when you can look at your sin and somehow in that you see God's grace and God's mercy and you see the blood of Jesus Christ that He shed for your sin, that He says greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you confess your sin, He's faithful and He's just to forgive your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. When you can look at that, and you begin to gain wisdom and you begin to look and say, what got me into this mess to start with? How did I get here? What started this? Where did I get off track? This was the end result, but where did it start? That's wisdom. I'm gaining wisdom. I'm learning how I got here and how I can get out and how I cannot find myself back here again. That's wisdom. That's mercy. That's discipleship. I was born a sinner from my mother's womb from the time she conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom. Even there. Even in my sin, you teach. Where sin abounds, grace doeth much more about. What do I do when I've sinned like that? Number one, I get honest. I call it what it is. Number two, I gain wisdom through the life-changing blood of Jesus Christ, and I learn how to hopefully avoid these pitfalls to bring me back here again. And then real quickly, we're going to look back at Paul one more time here in Romans. And Paul, we're going to see how he deals with what he's gotten into here. Caught in this web, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this life of sin? What do I do when I've sinned like that? Let's just... Let's just back up to verse 24 in chapter 7 again. He says, Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? Thank God. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my nature, I'm a, I'm a slave to sin. But look, at, look at chapter 8. So now, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent His own Son in a body like the body we as sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this 
so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead we follow the Spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about these things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind, listen, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, but it will. It never, it never will. But that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you're not controlled by your sinful nature. You're controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you, and remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you've been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, He'll give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So you've not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when He adopted you as His own children. Now we call Him Abba Father. For His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm we are God's children. Again, we are incredibly glad that you joined us here today at Church you to go to the website. There you can find any of our archive podcasts. You can send us an email about how God's working in your life or a prayer request. Or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking the giving button at the top right hand corner of the screen. Have a blessed day.